introduce um whoever you are what you do why you're here um i'm gonna start so my name is yemi um i'm a singer musician artist and um i am a black british female um and i am a straight female um and i come here from the standpoint of trying to navigate my own thoughts um with other people um, and hopefully create um some good potential responses for things that might very soon come up as we get into the real world. Um, so I'm going to go with complete random order, so please don't feel picked on. The first person I've got is Emily. Um, so Emily, if you're right to introduce yourself to the group. Hi, I'm Emily. Um, I'm 30. I live in Glasgow and I have done for the past 10 years. Um, I'm a white European, like white European heritage. I've got like French and Spanish in my family and British as well. Um, and yeah, I work as a musician and a singer um, as well, which is partly how I've connected with Yemi uh, um, in the past year is as a musician. So, and I'm just here to, yeah, to, to talk and to listen and um, yeah, just talk about these things because there's a lot to talk about and a lot I want to get out and a lot I want to hear about, so yeah. And next, Emmy. Hey, uh, I'm Emmy. I'm cisgender female. I prefer she, her. Uh, I am mixed race, and that's how I choose to identify. I'm half Scottish, half Tunisian, um, hence the curls and also the freckles. Um, I'm here sort of just to hear other people's experiences, to kind of maybe share a little bit of my own um, and to remember to stay in my lane. Excellent, thank you. Um, I've got Roxy next on my screen. Yeah, hello, I'm Roxy. Um, I am from Scarborough, which lots of people have heard of, but um, maybe haven't been to it. It is probably the whitest town ever. So I have grown up in the whitest background ever. Um, so I'm kind of here to absorb some different things from the echo chamber that I live in, really. Um, and also, I have been applying to join the police um, and it seems like a terrible time for that. So I'm kind of interested in hearing people's um, opinions and experiences around that kind of thing. Great, thank you, Roxy. Um, Bigger. Hi, I'm Bigger. I'm not gonna say how old I am. I'm straight uh, black male. Uh, I grew up in South London. I currently live in Suffolk. Uh, and I'm a vocalist, spoken word, poet, slash trade unionist. Um, and I'm here because i got stuff on my chest <laughs> that I want to go. But I'm also open to listening to other people's experiences. Excellent. Thank you. Mimi, next. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Mimi Gold. Um, I am... I guess an open-minded um I am I guess an open-minded human being um a black one um my parents are African and Jamaican Gambian um I am straight so far in my life I'm 30 so we'll see where it goes um I am a lot of things um but currently I have a clothing brand named Mimi Gold I also DJ I also do performing at the same place with Yemi at Albert Schloss. Um, 
basically anything that I want to do, I find out a way to do it. Um, and I guess I'm here because it's been a very strange time for everyone anyway. Um, and having to sort of relive, you know, past experiences or looking at experiences with your friends and seeing it a completely different way is quite a lot to deal with on your own. Um, and there's only so many friends I can speak to about it. So, you know, I'm interested in the wider world and what other people have to say as well. So I'm here to share and I'm here to hear. Yeah. Um, uh, Roisin. Hi, yeah, uh, I'm Roisin. Um, I'm white, British, Irish. I am from Manchester, but I've been isolating in a place called Chorley. Um, and yeah, uh, I'm here because obviously I want to listen and learn and just talk to people that are outside what a, a term that I've been hearing like, that's been thrown around recently is my echo chamber uh, and just hear different voices and other stories and yeah listen. Hey. Thanks Rasheen. Andrew next. Hey I'm Andrew. I'm probably older than bigger I'm not sure. I'm 54. Um, so, <laughs> um, I'm an anthropologist and a university lecturer, which is part of my connection with Yemi, because Yemi studied anthropology at the University of Manchester. Um, I'm here partly because, you know, we've been here before, but maybe there's an opportunity um, to change things uh, on the ground, as opposed to just talk about things. Uh, the other reason is partly professional is that you know, obviously, when you're working in universities, you're engaging with people from all backgrounds, all cultures, uh, especially when it's a subject such as anthropology. And um, so that's both positive in terms of it being, a, again, a, a, a mode of communication uh, and discussion. Uh, but also, you know, it's a very complex issue um, uh, when you're, you've got 80 people in a lecture theatre. Um, not everybody has the same backgrounds or experiences and it's how, how can you create um, an engaging place for discussion. So that's why I'm here. Thank you, Andrew. Helen next. Hi, sorry. Hi, um, I'm um uh, from the northeast live in manchester but i came by glasgow lived in glasgow for six years um i work i'm a civil servant i work for moj um and i'm here to just sort of consolidate some learnings and just sort of to try and listen to other people's experiences and um yeah and learn from that and try and bring the conversations that we've had here that i can take to elsewhere particularly in my workplace Thank you. Um, next is uh, Chris and Lily. Hiya, um, I'm Lily. I grew up in North London and I live in Manchester and um, I'm white British and yeah just I feel like a lot has changed but again like it's that kind of fear of the momentum stopping and I feel like I want to be part of a generation that actually actively learns and listens and really like tries to create long lasting change so i just here to like listen and learn basically and um i guess think about next steps um so yeah yeah uh, my name's chris i'm 32 um originally from west london lived in manchester for about 10 11 years um just here to find out really what people feel about the current situation and if there will be any actual change on on the back of it because from what I've seen there hasn't really seemed to be there's no real cohesion um, as into what next steps are or look like or how they're implemented so a lot of it feels like hyperbole and goodwill but it's what happens next absolutely thank you both um, and Imogen has just joined us just in the nick of time to introduce herself
I am really sorry that I got late. I've been having tech problems. Um, I wonder if you can see me now. I'm going to stop my video just in case my, because I think you've all frozen for me. Um, I'm stopping my video, but I'm going to keep on speaking in the hope that you can hear me, but I don't know if that's the case. But I am here to keep challenging myself to be part of conversations that might be uncomfortable, but without which um, we won't be able to unpick systems which keep us all from relating to each other, which keep us all from living an equitable life. Um, and I'm specifically excited by this conversation because of your provocations. Um, and it felt like to me that I want to be able to undo the denial that lives within me, um, deny the passivity around living a white supremacist life, um, and to accept the way that I really am, and from there be able to change it. I can see you all again now. I don't know how much of that you heard. Was that okay? Yeah, definitely much better without the um, video. Um, we did see a lovely face at the beginning, though. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad we did. Um, brilliant. Thank you so much, everyone. So um, as per the agenda that I set out, I'm going to start with a story that I'd like to share with people. Um, it's not necessarily a story that is uncommon, um, but it is a story that I've never, that I've not shared. So for me, this comes as a confessional. This is why I've kind of... Um, use the term confessional because um, we might end up sharing private thoughts that actually we've never been able to vocalize and this is very interesting. Um, the interesting thing about any kind of movement or resurgence of something, um, it really brings back things that you, <laughs> you forgot you um, experienced. So yeah, here goes mine. Um, so in terms of passivity, to me it's, it's knowing that I've passed the opportunity to kind of call out a racist comment. Um, um, and having kind of a strange guilt around it, but I won't go too much into the guilt. Um, six months ago, when I was working at a bar on Deansgate, I was sat singing a very busy bar, um, and a man walks past um, and very audibly says, she's all right for a black girl. And I'm literally mid-singing, I'm just like, oh, wow, like it almost happened, and I was like, oh, wow, that's how strange. And I get to the end of the song, got to the break, and I kind of like, set in what he just said um and I thought okay uh cool I mean should I have said something should I have should I have mentioned it to the manager maybe I should have got him chucked out or or actually maybe I'm not gonna maybe I shouldn't make a fuss about it that's kind of what um goes through my head when I have those kind of instances and as much as they are rarer than um they have been in the past um they or that same thought process goes oh should I say anything sure no oh, I don't want to make a fuss blah 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 um, you think, oh, should I have stopped my performance? Should I have shouted at him? Would they have thought I was an angry black woman if I had? I mean, what, what do I do with that? Like, um, if that happened now, I feel like I would have probably stopped and been like, excuse me, blah, 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 something, what you're saying is completely wrong. Why do you feel comfortable being able to externalize that at such an audible, <laughs> at such an audible volume that I was able to hear it over my singing? Like, I, yeah it was a very strange moment um like I say it was only about six months ago you kind of go through your mind and you think ah, freedom of speech etc obviously freedom of speech doesn't really um like apply when it comes to racism because you know it shouldn't be but you do then think sometimes okay well who am I to then stop you know him externalizing a thought maybe he's actually a good person blah 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 you make all these excuses um and it makes you passive to situations because you're just um accepting <laughs> that that's the way that that's that that's going to be and there's nothing you can change about that um and another thing about it is kind of like i don't know um being passive doesn't mean you don't feel it so uh it kind of you kind of have this like numbness where you feel all these emotions don't say anything about it and then you're just like okay but then as soon as someone mentions racism first thing that came to my head was that moment so even in that moment even if I was telling myself it didn't matter I didn't it, it wasn't I wasn't bothered by it it clearly did because I was it, it it's wasting it's taking up space in my memory somehow for some reason so it's obviously important um and I think that's probably 
I'm not even sure what to say that is, um, to be honest. Um, I might have more to say on it in a little bit. Um, but that is definitely something that is quite raw, quite fresh, and uh, definitely still happens. Um, I'm proud to be black. I'm not by no means ashamed of it. I find myself um, questioning whether I should be more so or less so or whatever all the time. But um, that is that is a deep rooted issue in itself. Um, I think when it comes down to it, like, I don't know, it's believing that there will, I think a lot of the acceptance of racism is believing that the genuine thought that I believe that there might not ever, ever actually be a world where that isn't a thing. Do you know what I mean? Like you generally just think, okay, that's just the way it is now. Cool, it's fine. But then you're, you're reminded that you're part of a constant circle joined up thingy of this is just one instance of things that might be happening in a thousand places right now. And that's one level of racism that could be happening. The next level could be actual genuine shouting and abuse. And that's happening with thousands of people somewhere else. And you just realize that everything that you're experiencing is connected to someone else's. Um, and you just kind of think, well, we've not come far enough yet, have we really? Um, and at the end of the day, humans can learn anything. Um, and there's just no excuse anymore. So um, there you go. That's kind of my personal story. Um, I don't know if there's, before we kind of move around to everyone, um, you don't necessarily have to speak out on what I've just said. Um, it might just be you guys bringing your cases to the fore first. But does anyone want to say anything on that at this moment? Does anyone have any like questions or any words that kind of sprung to mind when when you heard that? Feel free to kind of popcorn shout it. I feel like everyone's fairly res respective in this in this space. Yeah, I, I, I can definitely identify. For, for me, it's a little bit different with the passivity because it's like challenging it, like kind of there, there's a jeopardy in challenging it because like you will obviously get the label of angry black woman. I will get the label of aggressive, threatening black man. And that could mean security, that could mean police, that could mean a fight. So there's all those sorts of things running through my mind whilst I'm thinking about should I say something about this thing or or, or, or should I should I just let it go so I, I, yeah I just wanted to vocalize just that the jeopardy aspect of, of like challenging it when it comes out and also the sheer surprise like a lot of a lot of the time when it's happened to me it's just been like it's taken a minute for my brain to just hang on did, did, he just said something racist to me like, you know what I mean? Like, you're just not expecting it, like, in, 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 in your daily life. So, yeah, I was going to say that. Thank you, Bigger. Um, I don't suppose, I mean, because I was going to just kind of go around again in maybe a similar order to I that I did to the introductions, but did you want to maybe go next on? Did you have a story of confession, something you wanted to share? Did you bring anything? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's lots of... Um, I can, in terms of passivity, I can go right back to, like, being eight years old and joining the sea cadets and being in like the i don't know if you guys know what the navy uniform looks like but it's like a dark navy blue uh suit with like a white hat um and me and my brother we used to get called pint of guinness and like we both knew that was a racist thing but we were the only two black boys there so we kind of we laughed and um we we went along with it and I remember when we went home and I went home and I told my, my mum about that and the disappointment like on her face, you know, that we, we didn't challenge it is, is something that um, I, I will never forget. So in terms of, you know, the, the guilt around passivity, it kind of started um, from young. But after that, it was always very clear to me the first time I did challenge it and I did meet up against, you know, security or like a... a um, I had a, a, a physical response to my challenging um, a racial comment um, made to me. Um, it was always it was always clear to me in my life that that's the decision you're making. Like if you if you challenge it, particularly if it's a guy, um, like there's a likelihood that it can get physical. And if it does get physical, because I'm the six foot black guy, I'm always going to be labelled as the aggressor whenever the authorities turn up kind of thing but um something that happened to me uh recently 
that I did challenge was um, I was in hospital for an appointment um, and I was there for quite a long time having treatment and they were bringing around refreshments so like biscuits and tea and stuff and they were asking like you know what kind of biscuits you you wanted and uh, I asked for bourbons so the guy went and got some bourbons and he come back and he said um yeah me and my mates like we call these Jamaican custard creams and then just walked out of the room and I let him walk out and I, I it, like most of my mind was like I'm just gonna let that go because it's just hospital but then there was just part of me that was like I'm sick <laughs> I'm absolutely sick of like letting it go and I called him back and I was like do you really think I need to hear that like I'm I'm in hospital do you think now is, 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 is the time to be making like um, racist jokes to me. And in the end, what I feared would happen is exactly what happened. Nurses were crowding around me, telling me to calm down, telling me to not be aggressive and we're gonna have to get security if you, if you continue. So, you know, like, yeah, it's difficult, man, it's hard. I, 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 I don't know, I, I don't think that would stop me challenging it now. And I think that's just because I'm, older and I'm more comfortable with myself and I'm more I'm more confident and I'm I'm actually ready to take on whatever the consequences are but certainly throughout my life up until this point it's either been you laugh along with it or you just you just you just let it go because the hassle what's going to come down isn't going to be worth it you know Thank you so much for sharing that, Bigger. I've written a couple of things on that. Um, and I think when we come to the open discussion and say like 10, 15 minutes time, maybe we'll come back to some of that because that was one thing I wanted to ask. But um, if we move on to kind of, does anyone want to self-select to go next? Does anyone have anything that they wanted to share, a story, an experience, um, something they've seen that kind of fits into this idea of denial and passivity or just acceptance? Emily, thank you. Yeah. Great, thank you. Unmute yourself, yeah. Um, I, I uh, just on the topic of like, I, I like that's really shocking to hear what, what Bigger said, and, and the topic of like people just feeling com comfortable to share that, uh, to share those kind of, you know, to say, sorry, to say like things like that and externalize those those kind of opinions. Like, I, I fear that it's getting worse, like people are getting more and more emboldened and I'm just wondering if people think, it must be because of the political climate or whatever, it just feels like it's getting more and more to the right and extreme and like, um, so like last year, um, last summer, I'm, so not even a year ago, um, we had like, it's really stupid, we had an, like an oven delivered, right, and the delivery man, man comes up the stairs and delivers this oven and we, I live in a really, really mixed area, it's the most diverse area in Glasgow and the delivery guy just gets to the top of the stairs and he goes, I don't know how you can live here, man. And my boyfriend was there and was like, what do you mean? And he was like, you guys are the first British people I've seen around here. And he just, he just said that. We, just because he saw that we were white, he thought we would agree with him. It's just, it just shocked me. So I emailed the... But he put us in this position where we needed him to install this oven. <laughs> and, we need, you know, and he was right there and we, we weren't sure how to deal with it. Actually, I, was in, I didn't quite hear the whole thing my, my boyfriend was dealing with it. And he was just, you know, just agreed politely. Afterwards, I emailed the company and I was like, this is disgraceful and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, at what point do we, yeah, at what point do we challenge it? And, and um, yeah, I feel like I've observed that this kind of thing is getting worse. People just feel emboldened to say these racist opinions that I feel maybe used to be much more unacceptable, which I think is a really sad reality. I don't know if other people have observed that as well. Maybe it's just always been there and I haven't seen it, but yeah. Thank you for sharing that. It's an interesting one, isn't it? Because you're like, this person has power over me for this moment because they're the ones, I need them to do something for me. Yeah. Yeah. I know, <laughs> it's really, it sounds really, it's really mundane. It's just a delivery of, a, of an oven and I probably should have just told, you know, told him exactly where to go. Or my boyfriend should have, my boyfriend's a bit calm, like calmer than I am. So he kind of dealt with it more politely or whatever. But um, yeah, I just, I just can't believe the the goal of people to, yeah, they just assume that I'll agree with them. I've, said, I've had it from taxi drivers as well, just saying things like, how can you live around here? And I'm just like, what makes you think that that's okay to say to me that I'm going to agree with you? So, yeah. Before I kind of interject, does anyone have anything else that they wanted to maybe say or share on that? Because I was kind of going to maybe open it and open up a question um, and just kind of say, does anyone have any thing for the few stories that we've just heard 
things that they would say back? Has anyone got any, does anyone feel like they've got something that they would potentially say or have, have maybe said in a situation like that, Mimi? Yeah, hi. Um, I think for me, uh, whether it's a conversation about race or my gender or any conversation that I've had, usually with a man, usually with a delivery driver or something of that sort, you know, that just wants to have a chat and thinks that I have a, an open ear, I usually find that my initial, yeah, the surprise, then the like offense turns into like not a pity, but like. To me, it's like, how sad that that's your view of the world. So then I want to know why. Um, if I have the time, or if it's someone that I I think is worthy of my energy, then I will have that conversation. And I'll, along the lines of, why do you think that? Do you know what I mean? I want to understand where you're coming from, why your view of the world is that small. Um, let me open your window. Do you know what I mean? Um, and I think... For some people, that, that, that takes a, a level of patience, and I don't think everyone should have that level of patience, because some people need to be punched in the face, some people need to be shouted at. Do you know what I mean? All of it is valid and necessary at some point in time, um, but I just don't happen to be an aggressive person, how I deal with things, or you get nothing from me. I walk away. Um, in that example maybe that you gave, Emily, I probably would have sent him on his way with the title of a book or something or just been like do you know what don't need another one today do you know what I mean just I'm sweet like I don't even want you anywhere near my stuff in my house no do you know what I mean but it's it's difficult because it's it's such a, a snap thing and we've also got so much going on in our lives that's one thing I'm realizing during lockdown like we are constantly having to be consumed with stress and this that and we just want our lives to be as peaceful as possible so if you're faced with something like that and and say for example in your case Emily the offense might not necessarily be personal you know what I mean I get it there isn't time to think and go hmm let me be compassionate or let me address this person so there's a lot of reasons why things don't get dealt with I can see um, and I can see a lot of people feeling bad about it and it makes me feel bad but um, I feel like the uncomfortable bit is like we're here <laughs> do you know what I mean like let's dive in <laughs> there's nowhere to go so um, yeah that's my piece piece yeah. thank you thank you Mimi I can't remember who had their is it did Emmy have her hand up next did someone have their hand up next ah Rasheen sorry if you please go Sorry, I'm rubbish with technology. Um, yeah, I think if I, I, I was just trying to think of similar situations like that with a taxi driver or, you know, I mean, the, these professions that you are kind of stuck with someone, you, you're getting a service from them. Uh, you, you feel like, yeah, you don't want to, off or insult them because sorry I don't know if I was allowed to say that um yeah you're trying to get something from them at the same time and in the past I have called them out like I'm stupid like I don't know what they mean and I go so what do you mean, what do you mean? and I, I keep going no I don't I saw that I was saying can you explain it can you explain it and at the end I'm like ah right okay and it gets to that awkward point where they're kind of getting embarrassed themselves over what they've just said but I completely agree with what everyone said it is difficult to kind of put everything else aside and, and focus on that one thing but I yeah I think it's important that we do I, I know it's difficult and but like especially for white people I think it, this is the time where we need to be doing the work the most uh, if not all the work, uh, because, yeah, I do, sorry, it's just something that I, I think, but yeah, I'm very nervous, by the way, I don't no, know I'm an actor, I should be good at public speaking, but I'm just <laughs> terribly, I'm awful at it, so I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, not sorry at all, um, I did, um, wonder if, uh, I don't know if anyone had anything else they kind of want to say around what we've just heard, I've got a couple of things to kind of bring back into the mix and I'd be interested to just hear um maybe kind of hypothetically 
um, what kind of people think about these, or, or just if you wanted to share what you think about this comment, um, how it makes you feel, or what words kind of spring to mind. I'd like to kind of bring it up, try and get um, something from everyone. So, um, being laughed at um, in the past, and it was talking about school, school years, um, and being called, having braids and being called um, Bob Marley, what do you think is that kind of, um, like, where, where do you think that comes from? Why do you think people might say such things? And I'm literally being open. I'm not saying that you agree with it or disagree with it. I'm saying, like, a comment like that. Why do you think that people might say something like, oh, you're Bob Marley? Has anyone got their hands bigger? Yeah, like... <laughs> I, that, yeah, I've had that like everywhere. Like I, I went to Thailand and got that literally daily, Bob Marley, Bob Marley. And I think it came from a good place. I think they were just trying to, you know, put me in a category with just the only other black person they knew with dreadlocks. Ah, oh, you know, Bob Marley, Bob Marley. Um, so in that instance, like abroad, I kind of, I, I've, I've never taken offense by it because I kind of, look beyond it and just try and get to you know what they're trying to do is they're trying to make a connection with me so that that i can kind of kind of understand um i was fortunate that i went to like a very mixed school there was a lot of black people at my school so i never had that sort of stuff in school i don't know how i um feel about it in school but certainly every time i've had it it's usually been people genuinely clumsily trying to make a connection with me um, I don't want to put Roxy on the spot, but I do think there is something interesting that you did say about applying to be a police woman. And I wondered in terms of like, um, obviously it's your, your, it would be potentially your role to not be passive. Um, do you feel, even though you've not gone into that role yet, do you feel like you would be comf confident because of your uh uniform that you could step in in a situation yet you wouldn't step in in a situation perhaps if it happened in the house i'm not presuming i'm just kind of giving examples how do you feel about those kind of things well it, it's kind of not something that i thought i would come up against because i'm actually applying to a fast track detective program it was never going to be a police woman on the streets because i just that's not the kind of thing i'd be interested in it's more the sort of logic and solving things mm. um than actually being i don't know on the front line um yeah. so it's not the kind of thing that I would ever have come up against, I don't think. Yeah, interesting. Okay. Um, right, I'm trying to think of, I've definitely got another kind of story that I'd like to share, um, unless anyone has anything. Is there, is there any kind of, um, actually, let's, before I got, move on to another story, I'd like to, if I can, get a word from everyone that they're feeling kind of right now. I give everyone a few seconds to kind of think about just the word that they're feeling having heard what or or being in this kind of space right now from the conversation even if it's just awkward or if it's just you know I don't want to put too many ideas in your head but um it would be great to get kind of a a word cloud <laughs> from everyone kind of sat in front of me out of interest uh if that's okay um do you want to type it or Okay. Um, who has a, um, Chris and or Lily? How would you feel about share with any words that have come to mind and kind of in what's been happening so far in the discussion? Um, for me, probably quite reflective already. Um, and I think I don't know. I guess no matter how many stories you hear, like it's never anything like obviously experiencing it personally. But I think there's always an element of kind of shock and just a bit like really like recently six months ago and I think no matter how many of those like kind of anecdotes I hear it doesn't fail to kind of just make me really ashamed um and quite reflective of like how that's socially acceptable or how people are in that mind state where they can just project that onto someone who's performing or who's in hospital or literally just just a bit nuts um I think the police, um, Roxy, comment also interested me because I think you probably still will have those examples maybe in a detective role or in whatever it is in the institution you're working in. There probably still will be elements of racism in front of you, maybe. I don't know. I feel like 
it's such inst so institutionalized that no matter what level you are, I mean, I hope that you are working with people of color from all around as well, and that there are, it's an open environment. But I think even if you're on the front line or if you're behind the scenes, there probably will be those like scenes where people are, I don't know, talking, I was just listening to a podcast recently about basically a uh, black detective saying that he just kind of got a lot of stick all the time for saying things and then people would just be, yeah, they're like, why are you always talking about race? Anyway, just, I just kind of brought that up. Um, but yeah, no, reflective and yeah, just interested. Yeah, and I just think it's been interesting hearing what it's like to be racially assaulted because that's, that's what it is when someone abuses you. And it's that, that thought process that often that goes through my head by the time I think, well, yeah, were they trying to, were they trying to like make a joke or is that appropriate? How should I react to this? Is this appropriate? And often by the time I've gone through that thought cycle, then I think, well, is it too late to now call them out? And then all of a sudden I'm a victim looking at something that has happened that now I think is <clears throat> too far gone to go and do something about because it happened five minutes ago or like now that I've got over, I suppose, the shock or the insult. Um, so it's just interesting to hear from people that I suppose I'm not, it's not just me that either thinks, so I'm gonna have to do something later. And then potentially, as you said, like what happens if I get physical ultimately, am I gonna be the one that takes the blame because no one else here looks like me. No one here is gonna back me up, even though they all saw it. Um, and it comes down to those people that see it that are passive that sees something or hears, like, hears something that's inappropriate and then doesn't say anything. Um, if you compare it to someone that you see is physically assaulted, um, like most of the time, most people would say, well, stop doing that. Or I saw that some, like, you know, someone just hit, like actually most people then don't do it if they hear something that's verbal or see something like someone getting served before you are out of turn. Um, most people just see it, but ignore it. Um, an interesting, term actually that I've had, like heard really recently that like, was, like oh so that's what I suppose microaggression mm -hmm. and it's like okay so that's all of those things that I've been feeling or seeing but I, I don't think is really enough to react to that's what they are there are lots of little microaggressions that stack up um over time and then can then lead to actually a big reaction potentially from myself which actually in a lot of ways is justified but actually because the thing I'm reacting to is so small from that person other people then see well actually no you know, like, we need to stop like overreacting so yeah yeah it's it's so strange Andrew I know you had your hand up there for a moment yeah um there's a there's a phrase in French which roughly translates as the spirit of the staircase and essentially what it is is you hate your boss he does all these things to you and it's your final day and you're going to quit. And you go in there and you tell him what you think and then you slam the door and you're halfway down the stairs and you think, damn, that's what I should have said. That's what I should have done. And you can't go back up, and knock on the door and say, oh, by the way, um, you're also this. And you're just left with that feeling of the spirit of the staircase of wishing you'd said something, wishing you'd done some, said something. And I can think of numerous occasions where I have said something, and I think, can think of numerous occasions where I haven't said something. Um, and sometimes those things, you know, can haunt you for quite a long time. I can think of it, plenty of examples, but I won't, I won't talk about them now because we don't have enough time, but I can think of examples 20-odd um, years ago. And what's interesting in listening to Yeni and Bigger um, is how small things that happened many years ago are still with us today in that, in that kind of same sense of what you do with that. And I think the only thing we can do with it is turn into something productive, that's one thing. And two, is to think about how we might legislate for this kinds of things. And I thought it was quite interesting, um, I think, in what Mimi was saying, was how she turns it into a question. Mm. Uh, and so that's always you know, getting somebody to think, and, you know, they, they may or may not engage with that question, uh, but it's, you know, I, I think asking, asking a question demands some kind of response, and hopefully it won't be just a default knee-jerk response, hopefully, it, and, and someone else, I can't remember who it was, said they ask questions again and again and again, 
Um, so, you know, it's an opening to a kind of dialogue of a sort. Um, uh, but yeah, so that, that feeling of having wanted to have said something or not said something, um, the, the way that continues uh, to haunt you for, you know, can be quite well. Um, I can give examples if you want, but I've already said quite a bit, so I'll stop there. I mean, does anyone want to kind of say, Helen, have you got something next? Yeah, please do. Thank you, Andrew. I, it sort of it, it feeds into what Andrew was saying about things, um, things that you could have said that you didn't say, I guess the whole theme of passivity, and also a little bit to do, touching on what you were saying, working for uh, training to be a detective, and when you find yourself in that world, so I work for the Courts and Tribunal Service, and if you ever encounter the Crown Prosecution Service, if you ever encounter the judges, you'll find that racism really is, it's, it's very endemic really in the system, it's quite a terrible system from the ground up, and I've been in situations where the judiciary themselves have said things to me that, they're very, they're very clever, but they've said stuff where once you, you don't quite at the time but it is like not overt but very covertly racist things and then you leave and you think should I said something then and then you think these people are in a position of quite a lot of power over me here and this is my job and I, you know how do you respond in that situation and you do it is sort of you know the, the staircase situation where you're walking away and think could I could I have challenged them on that and these are people who you, who you trust to be impartial in a situation and like that's the really worrying thing is that there's people that you think are meant to be responsible and are you know supposed to help people govern themselves but they're you know they're making comments that most of the time go completely unchallenged and even above in their management structure above it's sort of it's a real problem um so yeah i think yeah that's kind yeah, of yeah, thank you for sharing that actually because that's that's kind of that's an industrial sector kind of insight that not many obviously um, understand and like you've picked up on the word covert and I've definitely thought about covert versus overt racism recently at the moment um, that kind of yeah that's interesting thank you Helen um, Emily um, I was just gonna say uh, uh, that's terrifying what you just said there Helen that's that's um, and really interesting like like you said like it's right at the top levels um, but um, I think that I, I think it's quite interesting that we've all We've all just basically said the same thing that sometimes, you know, whenever we've faced like been witness to like uh, small microaggressions or bigger things, sometimes you say something, sometimes you don't. And um, I really hope that this, it, I really feel like this could be like its Me Too moment, you know, like making the analogy to um, that Me Too movement and with feminism and everything. You know, a couple of years ago, I sort of almost planned my responses to whatever situation that I that I face and now when I'm faced with a sexist situation I know exactly what I'm going to say and it doesn't matter if it's small or big like I, I do say something um, and with with this I guess we're still learning like how, how to respond and what even these microaggressions actually are and like oh my gosh I witnessed this I didn't realize at the time but that was a racial you know racist thing or microaggression so hopefully like I feel almost quite hopeful after this just having this little conversation that um we'll know what to say and we'll know where to recognise it and actually not to be afraid to stand up to, at least like definitely for white people to stand up to um, a racist joke or something that someone says that is careless and to point that out. So that's like a little hopeful thought. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, it's a strange one, isn't it? So it's like, you feel like we're, we're only, why are we only just, um, I don't know, there obviously are, there is going to be a lot of books and, and things around what people can say, but not everyone's got the time or the capacity to read a full book on how to react when something racist happens to you. And um, this is why um, this in itself is so important because I've already thought like, no, when um, Chris was just saying about like what you do and don't um, say after, I would, I think if I have, have to relive that moment, I might just, overtly be like no and, and then get their attention and say no <laughs> no and then they can turn around and be and say what and then you've got that moment and you have to kind of take you know words might fail you or whatever but I think a simple just grabbing their attention that moment so that they remember that it happened because it could be the case that they don't even remember that they said that because it never got pulled up and uh you know um who knows what, what that person is 
you know doing now and they, but they're in my memory and I wish they weren't. <laughs> um, did anyone have anything else they wanted to share while we're kind of, yeah, Rasheem? Hi, I just wanted to ask about the situation. Um, was it at Albert's, did you say, where the story um, came from? Nice, actually, no, it wasn't. It was just a, it was a bar on Dean's Gate. Um, obviously, because as when you're doing gigs, you're hired in and it's not like a, sometimes a residential spot where you're, where you're there constantly. Do you feel at that particular bar that you would have been supported by the staff if it, it, or the management team? Um, is that something that sometimes you have to think about? Yeah, absolutely. I think, they, I, th I think you know, they would have supported me because they would have had to because under kind of maybe employment, you know, related kind of situation, they can't be seen to be not um, kind of tackling these issues or bringing them up. And you know what? I, I, I don't doubt that maybe that person would have probably got chucked out, especially if I'm the one working there. But um, the fact that I didn't have the confidence just made me question, okay, well, why don't I have the confidence to say that, even though I'm so confident, why don't I have, the, and it's probably my own personal issues, but um, yeah, I, I'm not sure. I do feel like, yeah, that because of the nature of it being work, I probably would have got the support, um, but it goes a bit deeper than that, I think. Um, but yeah, um, Emmy. I think um, just sort of speaking on that whole thing about managers or whoever else is in the venue and things like that supporting you. Um, I'm, I didn't mention before, I'm a theatre director and unfortunately racism is a systemic problem in theatres across this country. Um, I know for myself even not being black but seeing them supporting Black Lives Matter but knowing, having seen it with my own eyes, that that isn't how they practice on a daily basis and I'm sure for yourselves that's been very frustrating. Um, I think going to speak on what you've just said there Yemi about having the confidence because normally you're so confident like give yourself a break do you know what I mean like it's it's one of those things where like you are standing up for yourself every single day every tiny little microaggression you're taking onto yourself um every time someone asks you where you're from, where you're really from, all of that business, you know? And then it's really lovely to have somebody else to support you. And I think rather than, I think the questions that we need to be asking rather than about how we necessarily react in that situation is do we feel supported in the environment that it happens in to react in the way that feels the most natural, right? Do I, if I say something, if I call this person out, do I know that my manager has got my back or do I know that the people in my band have got my back or the people around me, that kind of thing? Cause it can be frightening. And, and much like what you said before, bigger about this kind of, there's peril there, right? You have to choose in that split second, you have to choose whether you want a, even a passive or an aggressive response to something like, do we just let it slide this time and just like quietly seethe or do we bring it up later? Um, do we mark it in our checkbook for the time that we go, actually, well, I'll tell you all the times that you've done this when they finally invite you to the table to have this discussion or that kind of stuff, you know? So I think like one of the things that I'm really hoping for, because I don't know if I can work in theatre much longer, if it doesn't change, is hoping for the rooms that hold decision makers are supporting people of colour and listening to them and believing them and not being shocked every time that they share a story, just listening, do you know? Because there's, yes, absolutely, there's shock there. But then there's also like, why are you so shocked? Like people have been talking about this for so long. They tell you every single day how these things affect them and your shock isn't helping them in that way. Like you, we know that you're not the problem, you know, it's about how do you, how do you support people in the right way, I think. And I'm really interested in finding the questions that need to be asked to organisations. I think that's me. That's great. Thank you. I think um, just in like um, reflecting on what you just said, but that 
the key word is questions. Like what kind of questions can we bring up to the people that we are around or work in on the environment with um, that will get us to, you know, that will support? I mean, I guess we're talking a little bit about policy and stuff, aren't we, essentially? Um, but that's what, that is, that is the next step, isn't it? This, all these conversations um, are going to have to lead to policy and legislation that Andrew touched upon. Um, Big, I just saw your hand. Um, yeah, I just I just wanted to talk about the whole support thing because that that incident that I talked about in hospital, the double whammy of it, the triple whammy of it was not only did I get the comment, and then not only did I get bum rushed by the nurses and the doctors and being told to calm down, is that in the conversation after it, the ward sister said to me, "Oh, I, you know, I say to them." every time he says something like that, you've got to challenge him. And I'm like, how much racist stuff is this dude coming out with that he's still working here? And like, in the end, like I'm in the position of saying, but there's minority nurses working on this ward that you're making them work around this guy. Like, why are you not tackling this guy? Like, so I've gone from, victim to aggressor to savior i guess it, it was a weird situation man like and that's the nhs so like what uh, yeah i just wanted to just share that bit on the, the being some because it is really important that if you're going to challenge these things that that you can feel like you have an ally that you can feel like you are going to be supported and i have never been in a situation where i've been able to challenge it and there's been anyone there who's been able to say yeah, no, you're absolutely right. That is out of order. That that you you are absolutely right to speak up. Like that has never been the case. Yeah, and um, the kind of next step to that is then why do people feel afraid to speak up, even though your ally, um, people in the in the situation, uh, watched it passively. Um, does I mean this is quite a big. You know, we don't have to start go into this. We've only got about five minutes left, but um you know is, can anyone speak on the fear that they've ever felt for trying to start, stand up for something at all um oh imogen um and then emily and then mimi um just briefly it was something i was writing down when you were speaking emmy about not having the confidence to respond in the moment like there's a neurobiological thing that will be happening right we get the fight flight freeze response so our brain kind of freezes so we don't necessarily have the responses in that moment so um there's and like chris was saying there's that like did it didn't it did that really happen did they really say that am i is it appropriate for me to respond so i guess that's where allies come in like we need other people who are not having that neurobiological response mm. to the aggression to be able to step in and say i saw that i heard that that's not okay um like as a woman i find that when if i get an aggressive comment from a man like I want other men to step in and say something and that puts me off if they don't and like we need to take that same theory into race and like white people need to know like if white people are doing that it's our job to step in sorry for swearing it's our job to step in and collect them and um that's our responsibility because it's not the responsibility of the person in the moment who's having that response and therefore not being able to think completely clearly yeah that's great thank you yeah you do have that that frozen moment and it would be lovely to have someone to just kind of like jump in and be like hey <laughs> um and then by that time you've probably had a moment to kind of calm and you can join them and you, you can both do it together and be this like double force of like and another thing um uh so i think it might have been emily and then then mimi next thank you imogen um yeah i was almost gonna um say exactly that imogen or, or rather like go on from that is that I like I read this um a few quotes recently that were um saying that uh, you know racism isn't a, a black issue it's a white issue as in white people or the majority have have the issue um and being really really careful not to trying to be really careful not to um you know cross that line into like the white savior mentality or make it all about like you know white people or whatever but it's um I white people in Britain are in this unique position where that racism isn't 
isn't going to be that, that um, horrible, painful experience in the same way that it is for black people. So, so they really need to be the ones to change, you know, to be the ones who are making the change in this, mo in this movement, in this moment, and step up. And I think it's almost, um, you know, everybody wants to be nicey-nice about it and everything, but it's, it's, a, it's an imperative, I think, and we actually need to be strict with people. Like, I've seen a lot of people on my social media, you know, white people getting upset when other people have been challenging them with certain things they've been posting recently. And I think all the discussion is really healthy, but, you know, the white people being like, oh, I can't believe you've been so horrible to me about it. I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying. And it's like, well, I think we do need to be really strict, actually. I'm sort of more on the side of um, being, yeah, not, not me, not nasty about it, but you know what I mean? Like pushing, pushing, really pushing white people to- Firm, like, yeah, <laughs> just, yeah, firm yeah. fair disciplined about it strict about it like we would with with any blood gory related kind of incident we would see have that same response but yeah, yeah like thank you crime there's no question but <laughs> um mimi and then i think i'm gonna have to wrap it up closing address haha <laughs> <laughs> um I was just going to touch on what Imogen, you said, and Yemi, you were saying that what we were going along those lines of, of I guess what we're saying is, is, is how much power we feel in that moment to say something um, against or anti or, do you know what I mean? Um, and, and as I said, I've been doing a lot of reading, watching, learning, and I do anyway, but in lockdown, it's kind of been like a mission of mine. I couldn't really focus on anything other than something informative um and i'm noticing that um yes all of these things are valid there are things like the fight and flight and so many different things but i'm learning that as humans we're so complex that every situation we come to we bring all of these extra things so there's the fight and flight thing that we have that you know these human experiences or human um reactions that we will all share but then you might have added things because you're a woman added things because you're black do you know what i mean you have your physical uh, limitations all of these things and i think um the amount of power that we are allowed to develop in ourselves just in terms of self-betterment time we have to think that we are powerless or we're insecure means that also in these situations we don't even feel that we are important enough to say something whether it's actively or not or consciously or not that's there so for me that's always been a thing where because i could never be told what to do i worked really hard on making sure that i can take care of myself because i don't expect anyone else to and i fall short loads of times and i rely on people loads because that's how i was raised with a very like you know apron string mother um but that's kind of why i broke away from it because i was like yo i'm gonna end up like breaking my neck if i keep living under my mum's skirt do you know what i mean i gotta toughen up um so i think developing your your power not even for any reason but just that you when you walk out into the world no one can tell you about yourself do you know what i mean you know who you are you know what your intentions are and also you're able to deal with your own mistakes so that when that situation comes if you get this backlash you're like no one's with me sweet let's have this conversation or you know what? i don't even have time for you today and it's a work in progress and there's times when you know literally i'm small i'm not gonna go to this man so say if i'm at work i might have to find my own way of dealing with it i'm gonna make you look stupid on your own and i'll stand here and do that and watch and laugh and walk away and say if i'm at albert schloss where i feel protected all the staff are on our side but wherever i go i make sure i'm comfortable with whoever's supposed to be in charge of me and if i don't feel like i can speak my mouth my mind my mouth my mind i don't work there or i don't be there or do you know what i mean that's not an option for everyone but i just want to say that it starts with empowering yourself and learning all the limitations that have been placed upon us so that we can remove them that was thank it thank you what a way to end it thank you so much thank you everyone this is been great um obviously tentative nervous around how this is going to go but i think that this there was a spark at some point and all the conversation and all the discussion came out and it's it's just great to hear and see and we're all in the same boat trying to go one way and some people keep trying to push us the other way but <laughs> i think i think we have it i think you know um we're getting there we're starting to get there um in terms of the last few weeks um but yeah i just want to say thank you to everyone um i was just I'll, i know we had a few words um to summarize how people were feeling i'm going to say these out loud in case anyone hasn't seen them so we had connected intrigued activated nice one reflective open 
Um, I think that was it. So yeah, lovely little word cloud there for me to take back. Um, and yeah, so I will let you guys know in terms of um, when this will go out. Um, and uh, I'll have to kind of look back and kind of listen and review it and, and see. But um, I'm just really grateful that it's got off to a start. And hopefully, if I continue doing it longer term, I've got six sessions on booked in the moment. But uh, um, if I do more than this, then I'll get some of you guys back to kind of talk about maybe other smaller um, or bigger issues, you know, I'm um, not too sure. But for now, I think that's it. I'm so 